morning. Thank you so much for having me and inviting me to be with you today. Um, I'm Kim Nicholas. I'm an assistant professor of sustainability studies at Lund University in Sweden. And I was a professor of Murphy's, so one of your organizers for the event you're at today. So very happy to be joining you. I'm actually coming to you from Stockholm, from the room where the Nobel Prize winners are notified. So I have quite a tall task to live up to today, but happy to share some of my work. I'll be talking today about the impacts of agriculture on the environment. And I got into this uh, through family history as well as personal and academic interest. This is a photo of my father growing up in California in the 1940s on a turkey ranch. So I have a long family history of raising food and thinking about the impacts that that has on the environment. My research has focused mostly on climate change and on impacts of climate change on growing crops. Um, so let's start with a question about food and climate change. Which one of these sources contributes more to global warming? Is it transportation or is it agriculture, specifically with livestock? Many of you may be surprised to learn that in fact, livestock contribute more climate warming pollution than all the trains, trucks, buses, cars, planes, and ships that we have on Earth. So livestock are a really big part of environmental problems, and I think we're looking today for some solutions around this. Um, so we see here that livestock contribute 18% of total greenhouse gas pollution compared with transport's 14%. Um, livestock is especially important in emitting two very powerful global warming gases. That's methane, which the new uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report shows is 84 times stronger than carbon dioxide. And the majority, actually, of nitrous oxide in human systems comes from livestock. And that's a that greenhouse gas that's 264 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. So livestock are a really big contributor to climate change. Since you're at a climate change workshop, I imagine you have been trained already and have a lot of understanding about the problem. But I'll just start by framing in a few short words the way that I think about the problem and the way that I teach my students in Sweden. Um, and those are points I took from the professor at Stanford, John Krosnick, which are things that everyone needs to know about climate change. So here I am with my students at a recent uh, People's Climate Mobilization Bike March in Lund uh, a weekend or so ago. And those five things are what I call Climate Science 101, which is it's warming. It's us, it's caused by humans. We are sure there's very strong scientific certainty. It's bad, and we can fix it. So we'll be talking today uh, mostly about these last two points, some of the negative impacts of the way we're growing food and livestock, and some possibilities for the future of making it better. Starting with that, as a conceptual frame, um, I'd like to offer this uh, from John Foley's group, which thinks about the need for a new food paradigm. So if we think about why, what are we doing with the food system today? We're trying to achieve these food security goals, where we have agricultural production of high quality real food, it's distributed fairly, people have access to it, and we have a resilient food system that can withstand shocks. At the same time, we're faced with some constraints that the way we grow and produce food produces water pollution and uses a lot of water. Um, it can contribute to biodiversity loss, and we've seen already it's a big contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. At the moment, right now, um, we have too little food security. So we have too little of this top part, and we have too much. There we go. Um, we don't have enough of, the, of real food and, and the right kinds of food accessible to everyone, and we have too much environmental cost to our food system. So we really need a new food paradigm. What we want is a more resilient uh, agricultural system that's producing more real food and doing so in a more environmentally sustainable manner. So that's kind of the framework in which we're talking today. Specifically, I've been asked to focus on the impact of livestock on the environment. So let me give you some information about that. Livestock uh, have quite a big environmental footprint. And it was eight years ago, in 2006, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization released this report, Livestock's Long Shadow. And this, uh, I think, did a lot to highlight the important role that livestock is playing in environmental issues today. So one thing that's really striking is if we go back 10,000 years, obviously the world was a very different place. One way in which it was very different is a tiny, tiny percent 
percent of the biomass, the living matter on Earth, of mammals, of us, of cattle, of wild animals, um, was made up of domesticated animals. So, um, and humans. We were a very small part of the biosphere. Today, we've become a force of nature. So humans have really started dominating the planet, and you see that 90% of the total biomass of mammals on Earth consists of us, humans, and the animals that we've domesticated to primarily feed us uh, and also do some of our work. So this is a really big change. Another big change over the last 50 years or so has been a dramatic increase in the consumption of meat. So here we see the consumption relative to one being the levels of consumption in 1960, the consumption today of different kinds of meat. And we see that chicken and pig consumption has increased very, very greatly. Um, cattle and beef consumption has also been on the rise globally, and less with sheep and goats, which are not as widely eaten. But global meat consumption is really up quite a lot. And this is putting a lot of pressure on the environment. We know that we live on the blue planet. Um, the Earth is more than 70% water, so our land is a limiting resource. And we have a lot of different interests competing for this resource. So people need places to live, to grow food, and to raise livestock. And increasingly, we're squeezing out some of the natural areas that we also need to provide us with clean air, with clean water, and that exist for their own right as well. So agriculture today uh, dominates about 12% of the ice-free land surface. This is soybean harvest in Brazil. And you can see this is an extremely um, different system than existed there naturally. So we're using a lot of land to grow crops. It's an area about the size of South America. We're using even more land, almost twice as much, to raise livestock. So this is pasture land where we're raising livestock. And this covers 22% of our land surface. That's an area the size of Africa. So together, humans are really farming the planet. The colored areas here show in brown where we're raising primarily livestock, in green where we're raising primarily crops, and yellow is where both activities are taking place. And you see that across continents and across much of the world, this is a really dominant land use, and people have come to actually be the number one land use on the planet. However, unfortunately, in many places, we're using this land inefficiently. So rather than um, growing food that feeds people directly, we're growing either biofuels or growing crops that are used to feed animals to feed people. And there's a lots of efficiency in that system. In some areas, um, you see here, for example, in green, that's where livestock are primarily feeding on grass. So people can't eat grass. Um, we use animals to transfer, transform grass into a form of energy we can consume. Um, so that means those calories are more directly delivered to us. In areas like in North America, where much of what we're growing here is corn or maize, and then that is getting fed to animals, we're losing a lot of efficiency in the system. So this is research that showed that if we were actually using the food we're growing already today and feeding it directly to people rather than to animals first, we could feed two to three billion more people. So there's a lot of room for improvement in our food system. At the moment, only 59% of the calories that are produced actually become food because of these losses to the system. We know that meat is inefficient to produce human nutrition. So uh, work from Emily Cassidy and colleagues has shown that Calorie conversion efficiency goes down as we go um, from dairy and egg products to beef being only 3% efficient in terms of the calories it consumes, turning into edible calories for humans. Um, protein efficiency is slightly higher, but still we see a lot of loss to the system. So there's, we know that meat is, uh, there's room for more efficiency in our food range. We also know that livestock are large greenhouse gas producers, and I, I've already told you this at the beginning. Here's a, the graph showing that um, a lot of livestock greenhouse gas production, even though we saw meat consumption, excuse me, beef consumption hasn't gone up that much, uh, beef are responsible for a disproportionate part of the greenhouse gas emissions from the, the animal's food system. Okay, so we've talked about land and how we're using land. Let's talk about water. Another limiting resource on our finite planet Earth. If we were to take all the water we have here on the blue planet and bring it together in one wall, it's surprisingly small. Shown here is 
all the water on Earth. So this is fresh water, salt water, water that's locked up in ice caps and glaciers. And it's not a lot. Consider, of course, that most of that is ocean water, which we can't use directly for irrigation or consumption. Now we're talking about liquid fresh water as a really precious resource, and especially the water we can easily access in lakes and rivers, really a, a, only a 56 diameter kilometer sphere. So um, you see that why there's so much competition over water. And in fact, an overwhelming majority of the water footprint that is used by humans comes from agricultural production. So some recent work has shown that actually 92% of the human water footprint comes from agricultural production, and a great deal of that is going towards producing livestock. Let's talk now about fertilizer. So we know we're growing a lot of crops in order to feed animals. Um, these crops need nitrogen and phosphorus to grow. Uh, traditionally, those nutrients came from animal manure. So this was a closed loop system. There were animals raised on the farm, they consumed grass that was grown on the farm, or hay. Um, their waste contained a lot of nitrogen and was used to enrich the soil and continue to grow plants. Now, we've actually broken that cycle. So, where do we get our nitrogen and phosphorus from? Our phosphorus comes from uh, hard rock mining in a few countries of the world, and that's a limited resource. And so we dig it up and ship it all over the world. Um, our nitrogen, we've more than doubled the amount of nitrogen in the, in the cycling in the Earth system because we've invented a chemical process that can take nitrogen from the air, 78% of the air we breathe is nitrogen, but not in the form that plants can use. We've made that uh, nitrogen accessible to plants by making synthetic fertilizer. So this has been an important part of the green revolution over the last 50 years. It's helped to more than double crop yields, for example, and increase a lot um, of yields around the world, so it helped to feed a lot of people. But it's come at a big environmental cost. So if we apply fertilizers at the wrong time, in the wrong place, or inefficiently, they can run off into surface waters. So lakes and streams take fertilizers eventually ending in the sea. And we have the problem of uh, water pollution. Here is shown as the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. So um, this FAO report in 2006 found that livestock are probably the largest source of water pollution. Um, 50, more than half of erosion, so washing soil from where it can be used to help grow crops into rivers and streams where it's lost from the system, decreasing our ability to grow food. Um, about a third of pesticides are used on crops that go towards livestock, and uh, also about a third of nitrogen and phosphorus pollution. So these numbers are for the U.S., but we see that this is quite a substantial footprint. Another impact is that we've taken livestock off the farm and brought them into these uh, intensive feeding operations in many cases. So this is an aerial photograph put together from Google Earth Images, showing here are uh, cattle in, in feedlots in Texas, and here's their waste lagoon. So formerly, this would have been um, valuable nutrient resources that are recycled onto the farm. It's now a toxic area that is not valuable to anyone, and in fact, causing a lot of damage. So clearly there are problems with the current food system. Let me show you a few numbers from a recent study. So this study was looking at the percent of, um, in, let's see, data for the US, the percent of impacts from different kinds of animal products. And they looked in four categories. So blue is for eggs, pink is for porks, pork. Uh, poultry is shown in yellow, dairy is white, and beef is shown in red. And we see here that there's an overwhelming disproportionate impact of beef consumption. So in overall, these categories were broadly similar. They, they were within the same range as each other, within uh, one or two, two times the same range. But beef, for example, uses 28 times more land to produce than these other kinds of animal products. Primarily, that's pasture land in the US, but it's also cropland that can be used to feed people. In terms of water use, a similar story. Beef uses 11 times more water than these other kinds of, of crops, um, or of animal products, excuse me. And five times more greenhouse gases to produce beef as these other animal products. And finally, six times more reactive nitrogen, so contributing to nutrient pollution in water. So ultimately, beef has the largest footprint of any animal product, and this is something to really seriously consider 
if we're concerned about the impact of our food choices on the environment. I've shown here that cow is very much bigger than these other, uh, other types of animal products, and that eggs have a lower footprint than the other choices as well. So let's take this, that's the production side of what are we doing. Uh, most of the impacts of our food choices come from the production of animals and of crops. What about the consumption side? Well, how much meat are we consuming? This map shows meat consumption globally. It's based on FAO data from the Food and Agriculture Organization. Um, and the darker red the color, the higher the meat consumption. So we see some countries like uh, the US and Australia have very high meat consumption. Um, there are regions such as Africa and India, with about a third vegetarians, so that have quite low meat consumption. Um, but to put this in context, how much meat is recommended for consumption if we take a nutritional perspective? This is from a publication by the US National Academy of Sciences, and it's uh, based on health recommendations rather than environmental impact. So there are health reasons to think about meat consumption as well. Um, their recommendation is about 0.7 grams of meat per kilogram of body weight a day. Um, so for an average person, that ends up being uh, 63 grams per day. Or if we multiply that out, 23 kilograms of, of meat per year. So this is based, this is the health recommendation. Let's put this in context. How much meat is actually being consumed? The answer is much more than this. So for a range of countries, um, we see even in countries like China, which is rapidly growing in meat consumption, but traditionally low, already uh, they're close to 60 kilograms of meat per year. So several times higher uh -oh, than the recommended limit. Um, when we look at countries like the U.S., they're even much more substantially higher than that. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, more than about five times higher than the recommended limit. So if we put that recommended intake here, we see that there's an excess of meat consumption from the health perspective. If all we care about is human health and we're not even thinking about the environment, there's a compelling argument to reduce meat consumption from this side too. So the answer to how much meat are we consuming, um, the recommended range falls in here, uh, and so that's that light yellow color on the map, the second to the lightest range. We see that there are many categories further above that, and uh, the answer is too much. We're consuming more meat than we should for our health and the environment. So how can we do better? Well, one idea comes from the Harvard School of Public Health. And this is their idea of the healthy eating plate. So this is based on extensive research, again from a health perspective, um, but it's a case where health and sustainability goals align. And one of their main conclusions shown here is limiting red meat 